Uh, my name is Sarah Neuter, and I teach in the Classics Department. Um, my, voice, my voice is going to work as hard as it can to talk to you about the voice today. So the talk is called The Mortal Voice on, this, uh, on the Ancient Greek Stage. And what I want to talk about is really the actual literal voice part of speaking. Um, so most of the time when you hear someone speak, what you're listening to is the language. Right? The voice is happening, but it's not something you're paying attention to. So uh, if you strain to hear me, then you might think about my voice. If I have a funny accent, you might notice that. If I'm singing, you'll think about my voice. If I cough, that's a way of forefronting voice. So I'm looking at moments when the playwrights um, on the ancient stage took isolated sort of vocal utterance instead of language. Um, so I'll be talking about uh, animal sounds and coughing a little bit uh, and cries and things like that. And before I get to that, I'm going to look at Plato. Uh, Plato hates drama, as you may know. He hates imitation, he hates poetry, but he's very, very good at talking about it, right? So he's a contemporary of the playwrights, and he's very skilled at getting to exactly what makes drama so powerful. So that's why I like to talk about him, even though I disagree with him. So here we go. This is a paper about the outer limits of the human voice on the ancient Greek stage, as expressed by the breakdown of language into nonsense. Here I focus on instances of such nonverbal vocalizing in Aristophanes and a satyr play as against a couple of moments of breakdown and tragedy, so as to consider the range of theatrical effects and implications that such vocalizations might have. Before I come to drama itself, however, let me pause to consider what is at stake in such instances of voicing from an ancient perspective. So here's Plato, sort of. Plato's dialogue suggests that the mimetic, mimetic voicing has a profound effect on those who hear these voices, but an even greater effect on those who give voice. His many objections to poetry, and especially drama, arise in part from the belief that what we utter makes us what we are, molding not only our thoughts, but also our voices and our bodies. He writes as much, ventriloquizing through Socrates as usual in the Republic. Or have you not perceived that imitations, if they persist onwards from youth, settle into characters in nature, in body, and voices, and even in thoughts? Yes, even so, he said. The idea here is that voicing in the form of repeated imitation, so this is the word mimesis, you might know, has power over the person who is voicing by impressing itself upon his character, by changing him. It is the power of the voice when used for false voicing that makes it so dangerous to a person's moral being. And a list follows of the things and people that must not be imitated by citizens of the ideal city, lest these citizens be influenced badly by these vocal pursuits. The list includes women of many sorts, so women who are wrangling, defying their husbands, boasting, lamenting, in love, uh, or in labor. <laughs> Slaves, bad men, which includes cowards, drunkards, and madmen, and also workers, smiths, craftsmen, and rowers. The list of prohibited voices is capped by those of non-humans, including both natural phenomena and animals. So this is another passage from the same part of the Republic. What then? Neighing horses and bellowing bulls and babbling rivers and the howling sea and thunder and all such things. Will the poets imitate them? No. Rather, these will be off limits to them, he said, both to be mad and to act like madmen. Right, so this is the part of the Republic where Socrates is imagining what the perfect city would look like. Right? And this is the kind of stuff that we are not going to allow in the perfect city. Since it is vocal imitation that admits of these problematic sounds, Plato suggests that only a very debased poet privileges it over narration to begin with. Right, so here's a description of a bad poet. So his style of speaking will derive entirely from imitation of voices and gestures, or will contain just a little bit of narration. <coughs> Imitated sounds, then, really ought not to be espoused by the human voice or the body by way of gestures. If they are to be admitted into poetry at all, they should be distanced through the filter of narration, an element entirely missing from drama, whose absence renders drama inferior and indeed dangerous. You may know of certain plays where you do actually have a storyteller, but Greek drama has nothing like that at all. In other words, the terrible power of drama arises from its use of false voice, voice that is not distanced from the speaker's identity through narration, and further from the potential for this voice to be deployed without speech, which in Greek is logos, so no logos, in the form of a bull roaring or something like that. And this is the crux of the problem for Plato. 
We have voices no less than other animals and with many of the same capabilities as theirs. Without the intervention of logos or speech, the distance lent by narration, our bodies, speech, and thought may easily descend to the level of beasts with our souls tumbling down. To the display of Plato, Athenian playwrights did at times compel their actors to imitate animals' voices on stage and called for other vocalizations that are either lacking in language or pointing away from language in meaning and effect. All this on top of the problem that these voices are not truly speaking from the actor's soul in any case, right? They're all imitations. They're all not real. In the laws, Plato's Athenian stranger again discusses the appearance of poetry in, quote, cries of beasts and men, clashes of instruments, and noises of all kinds. And he similarly disdains them. The muses, Plato asserts, would never combine the voices of beasts and men, whereas human poets, who senselessly weave together and completely confound these elements, make laughing stocks of themselves and destroy music in their desire for a beast-like voice. And this is all quotes. If to Plato or his speakers, the effect of this non-linguistic voicing is at best clownish and at worst fatally corrupting, what is the counter-argument implicit in the use of such voices in Greek drama? What is gained when Logos is lost? Aristotle echoes Plato, but with less apparent anxiety, in commenting that animals and humans share the capacity for voice, but not language. Even if some animals have voices, as he declares in the politics, human voices are different from those of animals in that we use our voice to express speech or structured language. If Aristotle's perspective on animal utterance as lacking in language, but still possessed of voice, can be taken as broadly representative of ancient views, then we can see how the use of animal vocalization on stage could be a way to highlight aspects of voice outside of its linguistic capabilities. From animals and from humans at times, voice emerges as embodied, meaningful, and especially expressive, and the more so when it is non-linguistic. Non-lexical onomatopoeia is one example of this kind of vocalization. Such onomatopoeia is defined by Derek Attridge as, quote, the use of phonetic characteristics of the language to imitate sounds without any attempt to produce verbal structures, end quote. This category includes, for example, mimicry of a dog barking. So in Greek, that's bau, bau. These non-lexical sounds sit at one end of a spectrum, the far end of the complex hypotactic structures that are often associated with poetic language in the 5th century. So 5th century BC is what we're talking about. Yet alongside flights of syntactic complexity, drama includes instances of such aggressive sound play that logical meaning may seem at points to subside in favor of vocalized sound. Such a broad vocal spectrum allows playwrights to work with, great, with a great range of conception of human life and to pay particular attention to life on the edge of human experience. There is predictably both delight and despair to be found at these extremes, both verity and fragility. So now we'll talk about comedy. What we have of Aristophanes' forays into this field gives us a sense of the possibilities. One suggestive example comes from the birds. Uh, so this is thought to be somewhat of a representation of the actual play, The Birds. The Birds includes an entire chorus of um, men dressed up as birds, about, so 24 people on stage with masks kind of like that, presumably singing and dancing. Uh, and all song and tragedies accompanied by, by an Alos player, it's like a recorder, so that's that guy in the middle there. The Birds features a character who is also a hoopo. The hoopo reveals that he has a checkered mythical past and he was once a human king named Tereus. So Tereus is an actual figure from Greek mythology. Early in the play, this hoopo summons the other birds onto the, onto the stage, the one who become the chorus that we see over here. And he's, he does this in song. So I'm giving you a clip of a little bit of the song he sings, and I, I'm giving you the Greek, although I assume most of you don't read Greek, as well as an English translation. Um, and I am going to highlight in blue basically the parts that I'm talking about, which are not actual words in Greek, um, but are sounds. And I'm going to read this aloud in Greek. Um, Epapapapoi, papapapoi, papoi, io, io, ito, 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 ito tis hodeton emon homopteron. So that's the first part there. Uh, it's two lines of sounds, and that io sound becomes ito. Ito is actually a Greek word that means let him come. And the third line is let someone of my fellow feathered friends come forth. And then the second part is 
Duro, 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 toro, 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 tix, kikabao, kikabao, toro, 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 lililix. So here we start with a line of, of a word repeated over and over again. That means hither, 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 and then a bunch of sounds. Aristophanes plays with the notion of the bird's foreignness to speech and with the expectations of the audience as he bats the hoopoe's voice back and forth between speech and nonverbal song. Initially, the hoopoe seems merely to repeat his own name, because in Greek, the name of the hoopoe is hep, hep pops, right? So those pop sounds are actually the name of a hoopoe. But these pop noises soon shift to a phase, a phrase that is also linguistically coherent, with the sonic effects of the repetitions also greatly enhanced by the marked metrical variety of the song. So remember that this is a song. It happens to be one where the meter is shifting all the time. The hoopoe's sound play with his own name echoes a Sophoclean pun on the Greek word for hoopo with the word observer. So we have just this little Sophoclean clip where he wrote, the hoopo observer of his own evils, and it's epoptein epopa. Little pens like that are not very normal in tragedy. This is an instance of aural wordplay that is unusually blatant for tragedy. In birds, then, the sound of the hoopo's chirps not only mimics his, his own bird-like name and performs with metrical skill, but it also alludes to the tragic incarnation of the shape-shifting Tyrius. The hoopoe's history of shifts in identity, dramatic genres, and life forms is thus signaled by his shifts between broken vocalizations and decipherable language. The hoopoe's next summons switches from coherent Greek, so that's the deuro word that means hither, to incomprehensible avian chirps, that's the toro. Right, so duro and toro sound very similar and rounds off sharply with an eek sound, a tix. The song then veers farther and faster into mimicry of bird sounds, from tix to kikabao, which in ancient scolius thought was intended to imitate the sound of an owl. This ends with the lililix, which has been considered a fair attempt at a bird's cry. So the song mimics birds, of course, but at the same time it cuts against straight mimicry with formal poetic qualities, since that lililix is also a perfect anapest, right, a kind of metrical structure that rhymes with tics. Thus the hoopoe's patterns of song and speech again imply that he is caught between his original human nature and his new avian identity. The hero of the play, who is a person named Pesotiris, claims that this bivalent identity is an advantage and explains to the hoopoe, quote, you think all the things that a man thinks and as many things as a bird thinks. In much the same way, the birds who come to constitute the chorus have been taught the Greek language but are still birds, as their chirpy patterns of speech demonstrate. So here, here's what the birds say when they come onto the stage. And again, um, the parts that are just sound, really not words, are in blue. Uh, so the birds sing out, po 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 where is he who has called me? Ti 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 ti. What dear word then do you have for me? Um, so the word where comes right after those sounds, and it's poo. So pa 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 poo. So it sort of grows out of the sound. And again, the word what tina grows out of the t's that have just come before it. <coughs> like the hoopoe, the birds of the chorus are pulled in two directions. Uh, for them, the non-lexical stutters of bird sounds indicate their automatic animal core, and the echoing words that follow show their training in human language. This comical state of limbo applies to many of the themes of the play, such as to the bird city that is suspended in the sky, and to Pesotiris himself, the hero, who tries to be bird-like by ac acquiring wings but remains staunchly human at heart. The bird, then, plays with the bending of ontological boundaries between these forms of life, but the incursions of nonsense into speech help to show that the boundaries remain nonetheless. So here's what like, a gaggle of birds looks like to, um, to your, your average Greek person. Um, what we have to imagine with this chorus is that they come out and they're stuttering and they don't speak very well, but as the play goes on, they actually become very coherent. Um, and I don't know if you have ever seen this play, but what happens is that Pesotiris, who is an Athenian, comes to the birds and suggests that they make a bird city and that uh, through their bird city they can actually take over the universe, which in fact they do. They take over the universe uh, by blocking the connection between gods and men. Uh, so that's, that's the play. Um, when the birds later cohere into an actual chorus and acquire clear, fluent Greek, free of all chirps and stutters, 
they also developed the wherewithal to fulfill Pesetiris' plan of taking over the universe. Their fragile grasp of human utterance at first makes them easy dupes for manipulation. Their subsequent hold on language puts them in a position of power on par with humans and ultimately with the gods. <clears throat> so now we're going to jump animals. A more complex example of aural nonsense comes from Aristophanes' Frogs, a play famous for its focus on the powers of the stage and freighted with influence in the history of literary criticism. So here is a picture of a frog. This is a coin from the 6th century BC. Um, this is what they felt frogs look like. But actually, I'm talking about a chorus of frogs, so I, I couldn't find an ancient image, but I did find that. So that is probably closer to what you want to think about as we move through this passage. So this play <coughs> has the unusual feature of having two choruses, one after another. And the first one is constituted by the souls of what are called in the play swan frogs. Though they are known more commonly just as frogs, their literal designation as swan frogs, of which there is no such thing, points to the joke of their presence, which is strictly an aural joke. These frogs probably were heard but not seen on stage, and thus are known only through the sound of their song. They proclaim themselves to sing beautifully in the manner of swans, but they are interpreted by the hero of the play, who is the god Dionysus, as croaking, disagreeable gibberish. When they sing in full sentences, their song is about the gods, activating the divine connotations of music. When they croak nonsense mishmash of syllables, their sounds strike the ears of Dionysus as dissonance from the maws of beasts. Some of the humor in this scene obviously arises from the juxtaposition of a high-handed musical rhetoric and croaky noise, language and voice at play. The fro frog chorus appear for just one brief interlude, the crossing of Dionysus to the far shores of Hades. So in this play, Dionysus, the god, laments that because Sophocles and Euripides have died, there's no tragedy left in Athens, and Athens is, is falling. And he needs to go down to Hades and bring one of them back. Um, so the beginning of the play involves him leaving Athens and making his way across the river of the dead to go to, go to the land of Hades. And as he's crossing the river and rowing across, he hears the songs of the frogs. <coughs> Charon, chauffeur to the newly dead, presents the song of these frogs as a solution to the problem of Dionysus' self-professed inability to row the boat, uh, which he claims with a declaration that he is, quote, inexperienced, unseafaring, and unsalamized, which means he didn't fight in the Battle of Salamis. So in Greek, this is a very, uh, like a silly phrase. It sounds sort of like this, aperos athalatatos asalaminos. Uh, and so it's a phrase that's meant to sound sort of ever sillier, that and perhaps signals the movement that's happening here from sense into kind of absurdity. Charon replies to Dionysus that it will be easy for him to row because as soon as his oar strikes the water, he will hear most beautiful songs. Charon then identifies the swan frogs as the singers of these songs. This joke rests on the fact that song was actually used to regulate the rowing of triremes in ancient Greece. Song, as its most basic, is the combination of rhythm and shifts in pitch. And an even rhythm, all apart from melody, sound play, or words, can have the literal effect in the world of compelling the acts of many men to fit together and fitting men into the world. So we see this with marching songs. And in the ancient world, you would have a bunch of men rowing, and you would have somebody keeping time. Right? Charon signals the frog's coming descent into nonverbal voicing with his own final utterance before the frog song, which is, here, I'll read it to you. Um, oh, up, up, oh, up, up. A line that is probably best not rendered into English, but one translator has suggested heave ho, heave ho. Rhythm is on display for lampooning here, as well as the power of voice through rhythm to organize, spur, and here also simulate movement. So I'm going to show you two little excerpts from a much longer song in the play. It lasts about 50 lines or five minutes, maybe. So that's Karen, Karen at the top, right in the blue, oh, 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 oh. And then the frogs chime in. The first and second and final line of their opening utterance, and again, this is all in song, is brekekekex coax coax. Um, that doesn't mean anything. It's just nonsense. And uh, among classic students, it's kind of a famous phrase, right? the, the coax. Um, and this line gets repeated throughout the entire song, which is kind of a call and response song between the frogs on one hand and Dionysus on the other. Dionysus is presented as an unhappy participant, both in the rowing and as an audience to the song of the frogs. 
and responds to them with ever more irritated cries of frustration. The frogs continue blithely with their song and emphasize its musical qualities. This is not on the slide. They proclaim it as sweet sounding and then engage in some name dropping to puff up their divine connections, claiming to have sung in a festival for Dionysus himself. They suggest further that they are beloved of the lyre-loving muses and hoofed Pan who plays tunes on the reeds and of the harpist Apollo because of their stewardship of the marsh reed, a physical necessity for the instruments of these gods. Thus the frogs comically root their musical value in the material of the marshes. Dionysus and the frogs are paired off then as antagonists in a sung battle. After cursing their coaxing and begging them to stop, so that's up here, Dionysus says, but go to hell with this very coax, for there is nothing aside from the coax. Uh, he then assumes the cries, the frog's cry of Brekakakek's coax, coax himself. So late in the song, he takes it over and sings it on his own. Uh, and sings to them in triumph that he will conquer them with the coax and forever keep them from the coax. And that's, I have conquered you with the coax, Brekakakek, and so on. Um, so what he does here is he takes that little sound coax and he puts an article in front of it and he makes it into a noun. All right, so thus by appending and declining an article, Dionysus transforms and domesticates the non-lexical sound coax into a word, coax, which metonymically represents the whole song and sound and indeed the whole existence of the frog since we can't see them, we only hear them. In effect, he turns the non-linguistic sound of coax into a perfectly semantically acceptable noun voice in his vocalization becomes language. Dionysus manages his transformation at the same time in the play that he starts to come into his identity and powers as a god, indeed as the god of theater and all such staged vocalization. <coughs> to beat the frogs is to conquer sound with speech. Now we move to satyr plays. Uh, and there's a satyr. Other examples from Greek drama show that such nonverbal expressions tend to appear when the poet is bringing attention to the body and the fragility of mortal existence, even when this corporeal fragility is humorous. I turn out to satyr plays, a strange breed of romantic drama which were staged in Athens right after the tragedies and written by the tragedians themselves. So if you saw a tragedy in Athens, you would go to a festival, you would watch three tragedies by, say, Aeschylus or Sophocles, and then a satyr play by that same playwright. Um, these plays, these satyr plays, of which we have little left, all featured a chorus of satyrs with their leader, Silenus. So you take this chorus and you would drop them into sort of strange romantic adventures, like kidnapping stories. Um, so a satyr is a kind of like half man, half goat creature. That ha you can see this in this representation. There's a tail, there are like weird goaty ears, and there's also a big phallus. And that, that's what we think satyrs look like as a chorus on stage. Mark Griffith has written that satyrs engage the Athenian audience, audience in an appealing fantasy, suggestive both of a return to childhood and drunken revelry. A long fragment of one satyr play, Sophocles' Searchers, provides some basic examples of how non-utterances are used as part of this fantasy. So, this is a, a long passage, and I'm just going to look at a couple moments from it. This passage gives us the chorus releasing ejaculations of surprise, right? So these are in blue. This hoo, 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 and nearly unpronounceable expressions of, of fright. So hoo, hoo, ps, ps, ah, ah. Right? Well, look more at this in a moment. These kinds of vocalizations are indexes of not emotions, but internal bodily affairs. As such, they are sometimes called corporeal sound symbolism. They include everything from spontaneous cries of emotion to acoustics of di digestion. So this is burps, hiccups, farts. Satyrs are, above all, corporeal beings, known for their addiction to bodily pleasures like drink and sex. These proclivities are visually marked by their prominent phallus that you see over there. The physicality of the satyrs that we see in voice like this is underscored when they are ridiculed by their leader, Silenus. And he says, who suggests that they are lamenting in such cowardice they will make a noise, which seems to mean fart here, right, it's up here. The occasion of the satyrs' panic in the searchers makes their would-be farting all the more comic and absurd. Their alarm and the sounds that express it are provoked by their hearing the sound of the lyre, a stringed instrument newly invented by the lonely infant Hermes as a source of comfort and pleasure. So the story is something like the baby, the god Hermes, has just been born, 
he finds a turtle shell and he scoops out the turtle and he makes a lyre. Um, and this is the beginning of lyre music in, in Greece, is the story. And the way that's staged in this play is that the chorus hear the sound and they're terrified of it. And they don't know what it is. And then it's explained to them over the course of this and other passages that this little baby god has created the sound. It's very charming. As the satyrs learn more about the auditory sensation of the lyre, the vocabulary they use to describe its music changes. First it is just a sound, and later is it, refer it is referred to as a divine voice, and then as the voice of a dead creature. Finally, when the satyrs understand the sound, they pronounce it an umphe. So that's down here. Um, umphe is a word for divine voice that is used exclusively in Greek literature of authoritative utterances like those of gods. And actually, it's useful to know that ancient Greek has a whole range of words for the voice, um, many, many more than we have in English. Thus, the chorus's early inarticulate vocal emissions, their hoo-hoos and so on, not only result from, but also draw attention to the birth of a new sound, lyric music, which is imagined as born from the death of a turtle, transforming a body from silent and bestial to melodious and divine. The satyrs, beast-like themselves, bring the corporeal, excretory side of sound onto the stage, just as the divine lyre can also be heard, and perhaps undercut by the vocalizations of the body. Or we actually have to imagine that lyre music is playing and that maybe satyrs are being shown as if farting, probably with outside help. <coughs> Yet at the same time as these low corporeal emissions are juxtaposed with the melodies of the lyre, the lyre itself is posed as another juxtaposition of voice. A divine sound sings from a dead, previously dumb beast and an inarticulate child makes song blossom throughout the land, which is how, it, how it's pictured. All right, tragedy. <coughs> In tragedy, predictably, the role of nonverbal nonsense diminishes, and the voicing of animals is almost never found, although there are nonetheless hints of proximity to the world of animals and infants whenever vocal nonsense intrudes. Here, the reduction of voice to nonsense supplies a way to convey the razor-sharp edge of human experience, suffering that is so extreme that sufferers depart from the realm of representational language. Unlike the mimicry of birds' songs or frogs' croaks, these vocal expressions are not icons or imitations of anything. Rather, they are indexes of pain in the broken voices of characters who are otherwise pointedly articulate. The departure from verbal language becomes the most revealing aspect of these passages, the very fact that the speaker cannot maintain the business of grammatical, lexical constructions or return to language only by force of a repressive will. They are drawn into the material of vocalization to display the materiality and indeed the mortality underlying their embodied existence. In Aeschylus' Agamemnon, we see voice expressed with an incisive lack of articulation when the character Cassandra begins her song with apparently inarticulate cries of grief. So Cassandra, you may know, is a character from, from the Trojan War story who is the only one who could see all the bad things that were going to happen and who warned the Trojans, but they didn't listen to her. And she's always pictured as, as singing. She's very articulate, she has a very beautiful voice, and so on. But when she's brought onto the stage in Agamemnon as a slave, uh, she is at first silent, and then she starts, uh, she starts her song in this way. Um, so I will read this to you. Atatatoi papoida, o Apollo, o Apollo, atatatoi papoida, o Apollo, o Apollo, o Apollo, o Apollo, god of avenues, my Apollo, you have destroyed me entirely and for a second time. So, the progression of sound into sense here is not dissimilar from the one performed by the hoopo and the chorus of birds in Aristophanes' birds that I talked about before. Cassandra's cries of papoi that we see in blue here, so that's just inarticulate cries that means nothing, fade into the coherent O Apollo. Um, which is opolon, right? So it echoes the sound, which transforms again into the stark verbal declaration, you have destroyed me, uh, which in Greek is a sound that is just like the word Apollo. So Apollo apolesas, as if it were kind of the same word growing into something longer. The first two lines are repeated as an echoing refrain of ot, op, and pol, but these sounds change through puns into meaning with the name Apollo sounding like and then meaning destruction. 
The bird sound play in Aristophanes' Birds is played for laughs. This one shows with serene clarity Cassandra's movement from the terrifying interiority of her mind into the lucidity of conversant language. These utterances occur soon after Clytemnestra, who is the queen of Greece, uh, Argos, who is, who is taking in Cassandra as a slave and soon will murder her. Soon after, C Clytemnestra suggests that Cassandra must have only an unknowable foreign voice in the manner of a sparrow. A little later, Cassandra calls herself a nightingale, who pronounces the name of her lost son, Itis Itis, a name itself that becomes a symbol of grief. There is some play in these moments with the idea that Cassandra is more animal than woman, more a maker of sound and song than a speaker of speech. Indeed, Cassandra is commonly understood to dwell at a focal point between identities, <coughs> unmarried maiden and yet consort to Apollo, Agamemnon, and Hades, prophetic yet pathetic. Here in Aeschylus's rendering, she acquires also the ambiguities available in voice as her words are revealed to be nonsensical yet incomparably fluent in lyricism and metaphor. And all this from a girl who speaks like a bird. <coughs> Aeschylus thus makes use of the edges of logos, or speech, to allow voice to surface. So this is my last big example. This is from Sophocles' play Philoctetes. Um, Philoctetes is a Greek hero who we're told is, it was left on an island at the start of the Trojan War because he had been bitten on the foot by a snake. Uh, and he got a wound from the snake which was gooey and smelled very bad uh, and it was always making him cry out and it disturbed all the Greeks so they just left him <laughs> on this island and they went off to fight the Trojan War and, that, and they did that for a long time uh, and then they were told by a prophet that they couldn't win unless they went and got him back. So they go back to the island to get him and they send in this, according to this version of the story, they send in this young man, Neoptolemus, who's Achilles' son, to go and convince Philoctetes by lying about who he is and what he's there for and to, to get him off the island. Um, and so Philoctetes, when we meet Philoctetes, he's a very noble and wonderful man. And Neoptolemus, who's lost his father, uh, takes to him as a kind of a son. Um, Sophocles' hero Philoctetes also stands out as a flamboyant vocalist of nonsense and the most sustained sufferer of physical pain on the Greek stage. He is also one of the most vocably variable of tragic characters, capable of expressing his position in a panoply of song, speech, and other marked linguistic devices. Yet he is never more striking than when his language breaks down into the apparently non-lexical, as in this passage. So it's a long passage and I won't read the whole thing. Um, but basically what's happening here is he's about to leave the island with Neoptolemus and suddenly he has an attack, a terrible attack of pain in his foot. Um, and so he has a past where he's trying to suppress the pain um, because he doesn't want to be left again. Um, but the pain is, is forcing him to vocalize these cries. So he screams, ah, ah, ah. And Neoptolemus asks, what's going on? And he says, nothing, nothing, nothing. And ah, ah, ah. And it goes on this way. And finally, he releases a series of cries. Papai, ah, pa, 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 pa. Do you understand, child? And Neoptolemus says, what? And Philoctetes says, do you understand, son? And Neoptolemus says, what's happening to you? I don't understand. And Philoctetes says, how can you not understand? Pa, 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 pa. The extreme quality of Philoctetes' suffering is expressed by his inability to suppress these incredible processions of sound. How shocking would these sounds have been to an Athenian audience? How much a break from sense and meter? The opinions of different editors of this text are instructive here, for we see the limits of our ability now to answer even these most basic questions. One editor, Seth Schein, asserts that Philoctetes' grief of ah, 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 ah are unmetrical. Right, so all tragedy is metrical, so it's very odd to have anything break out of the meter. But another one insists that they form segments of an iambic line and prints the text accordingly. These editorial choices indicate different notions of the limitations of vocal expression and tragedy. All commentators agree that the most notorious series of cries, which is this pa 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 is also perfectly iambic, right? So it's an actual iambic line of Greek. But two editors tease out more complex forms of sense from this senselessness, with one connecting the final four pa pas into an unbroken string and showing that what we see then is a sort of tricolon, a three-part series of agony. Seth Schein, again, draws attention to how Philoctetes' cries of papai fit with the language and themes of the play. This is a quote. Philoctetes' cry conspicuously reiterates sounds suggesting pice, which means child, 
and papa, which you can probably guess means, you know, I guess, means father. Yet this interpretation threatens to suppress the destruction wrought on language in this passage and the complementary drawing of attention to the material and mortal voice here. A listener, no less than a commentator, may well be tempted to try to piece logical meaning back together from these broken syllables. What results is a variety of plausible ways of reading and experiencing this vocal flight that invite further questions. Esophically showing how pain compels speakers to shatter the boundaries of sense and turn to the expressivity of nonsense. Or that even in this break from sense, semantic and poetic structures of sense building remain intact. Either way, Philoctetes allows the audience to dwell in the experience of voice overwhelming language, carrying its materiality as expressed by several series of popping peas in which one can probably hear the sounds of father and child, roles that would lead the protagonist back to coherence and ultimately back to society. Such desperate moments in tragedy reveal an ongoing state of vulnerability that is intrinsic to mortality itself and reminds us that our semantically rich locutions can dissolve into the babble of vocalization at any time, a babble that has no Aristophanic glee about it at all. And yet there is a point of connection between the gibberish of the birds and the cries of Philoctetes. For Philoctetes, as his mo at his most distraught, screams like a beast in pain, but also his shy notes like a baby calling for its father. Pa, 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 pa. These are the very syllables earmarked by uh, Theophrastus some hundred years later as a paradigmatic manner of conversing with an infant, with the P sound standing out most prominently in the Greek. So he describes somebody who he says is taking a child from its nurse, chewing its food himself to feed it, and then speaking in baby talk, clucking and calling it Papa's little knave. And in the Greek, that phrase Papa's little knave is all these little P sounds again, like pa 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 pa. In fact, any string of repeated syllables might call to mind the babble of babies, for whom voicing <coughs> chains of repeating syllables is a standard method of language acquisition. For babies, of course, have no language, only voice. This state of infancy contains both the capacity and lack that we lose as we acquire language, with the number of phonemes we are able to decipher and produce radically diminishing in the first months and years of life. Alongside our babble in infancy is a complete alignment of body and self, with nary a dishonest or evasive utterance escaping our infantile mouths. This alignment of body, voice, and truth is, as we know, completely lost later in life, a loss that perhaps allows for the sense of fascination or even longing felt in the presence of inarticulate human voices. Is babble, nonsense, and gibberish then always just below the surface, or is it the sound of something lost? I have been speaking of languageless vocalization as an ever-present potential, but it may also remind us that there is, in fact, nothing truly ever present about us. By the time a person is able to notice that babble or non-lexical communication exists in a separate sphere from semantically communicative language, he is no longer a baby himself and rarely called upon to produce or notice voice apart from language. Thus, babble, pure non-semantic voice, is more often observed than emitted by those who do observe it. It is the capacity of our children, not ourselves. One is reminded of Dolar's evocation of infant and parental communication, in which he notes that babies do not only imitate adults, as is so often suggested, but rather the opposite. Adults imitate children. They resort to babbling in what is no doubt a more successful dialogue than most." End quote. What makes such co-babbling seem successful is the sense that one has gotten beneath the evasions and circularities of language, dug down to a Rousseauian ideal of pure communication pure existence and pure being that cannot last. Aristophanes, clearly aware of the attractions of pre-verbal communication, has his character in the clouds, named Strepsiades, who has an adult son, reminisce nostalgically about just such an exchange. He says, whenever you said brew, I understood and would bring something to drink. When you asked from mama, I would come bearing bread. In these words, brew and mama are not real words. In clouds, this striking and even touching memory of perfect communication arising from half-baked childish vocalization contrasts sharply with the mess of meanings made by sophisticated rhetoric, that is speech, at the end of the play. In closing, I would suggest that the staging of the most material and thus embodied quality of voice is a means of grasping at some most intrinsic part of the human experience. Paying attention to the embodied mortal voice in ancient drama is, at its most successful, a means of recovering a living expression of vocal sound, 
And yet it is also an acknowledgement that these voicings are trapped in time and lost in the past. We cannot nail down the voices of the stage or define them, yet nor should we dismiss them. Cicero cites Demosthenes as being asked the most important element of oratory in answering delivery, and then giving the same answer with the second and third most important elements too. As Shane Butler writes on this passage, quote, delivery is more or less definitionally comprised by those parts of an oratorical performance that cannot be transcribed. In this way, delivery is precisely the aspect of Greek drama we do not have and could not keep even if we had experienced it, a fact that holds true for all perceptions of voice. Drama combines the fleeting temporality of existence with the corporeality of actual people on a stage. Its offering of presence and forthcoming absence in the form of sound and forthcoming silence is an apt analogy for the experience of having, if briefly, a mortal voice. Thank you.